I'm delighted to be here to tell you about our company, Cerevasc. Cerevasc is a uh, clinical stage medical device company focused on uh, neurosurgery space. Our first target is the treatment of patients with hydrocephalus. Uh, it's a very large opportunity. Estimates are the prevalence of hydrocephalus in the United States is about a million patients. Uh, the, the current standard of care is a 60-year-old standard, which requires open surgery and has an extremely high rate of failure. We have a very different approach in that we've developed a novel uh, endovascular approach to the treatment of these patients. We have clinical data that looks really strong, uh, very good safety and early efficacy data. There are multiple inflection points over the next 12 months, uh, including an IDE for a pivotal trial in the United States. Uh, the management team is a team that's been together for more than 20 years in some very successful companies that you may have heard of, Cytec Corporation, Exact Sciences, Insulet Corporation. And finally, we've, got, um, we've spent a lot of time and effort in building the, the uh, IP portfolio around what we do. Hydrocephalus um, is, again, affects an estimated 1 million patients in the United States. There are two general forms obstructive and communicating. Communicating hydrocephalus is the, the predominant variety, representing roughly 80% of the cases. The etiology is, uh, can be congenital, can be acquired as a result of head trauma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, and then a very large population of the elderly uh, are affected with a disorder characterized by ventricular enlargement and a triad of symptoms um, that's very distinctive uh, and, and because of the standard of care, <clears throat> excuse me, and the rate of failure, uh, many of these patients go untreated. The symptoms of hydrocephalus begin with headache and then become, be, escalate to eventually uh, death if it, if it goes untreated. Um, and communicating hydrocephalus is a disorder of absorption. Each of us produces roughly 450 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid per day that's produced by tissue that line the lateral ventricles of the brain. We can only accommodate about half of that. So there's an absorption that takes place of this excess cerebrospinal fluid that occurs through structures called arachnoid granulations. And these are outcroppings of the arachnoid layer of the brain that allow cerebrospinal fluid under pressure to pass from the subarachnoid space back into the venous system. So it's a pressure-driven uh, uh, one-way valve called the arachnoid granulation that allows for you and I to maintain normal intracranial pressure. Again, the, the prevalence is estimated to be about a million patients in the United States. More than 80% are in the category of communicating hydrocephalus. And the largest segment, again, is, is this elderly population that has ventricular enlargement and have a, a very distinctive triad of symptoms uh, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, is, is recognized generally by the, by the general practitioner, the neurologist, and the neurosurgeon. The current treatment for hydrocephalus is 60 years old. It involves uh, shaving of the head, uh, a, a incision in the scalp, a burr hole in the skull, a catheter passed down through the white matter of the brain into the lateral ventricle. That catheter is then attached to another catheter segment <clears throat> attached to a valve that's placed under the skin, typically behind the ear, and then a long tunneling procedure takes place across the chest and abdomen where the distal end of the catheter is left, <clears throat> excuse me, in an incision in the peritoneum. So cerebrospinal fluid produced in the ventricle passes under pressure through this long catheter system and is reabsorbed into the peritoneal cavity. Uh, the failure rates that you'll see in the literature are anywhere from 40 to 50 percent within the first couple of years. Patients require either an entire replacement or a revision of components of this system. And the, the complication types are listed here. Obstruction of the catheters that takes place, um, ventricular catheter misplacement at the time of the initial surgery, overdrainage, which is a particular problem in the elderly, when the patient uh, changes position from lying to standing, there's a negative hydrostatic pressure that occurs within the long catheter that drains too much cerebrospinal fluid. Infection is a really difficult problem for these patients in that they have meningitis. They, they're admitted to the ICU. They have the, the system disconnected. They drain CSF to the bedside through that ventricular catheter. 
and they're on antibiotics for several weeks, so it's a, a, a very, uh, a particularly difficult complication. And finally, there are mechanical failures that occur simply as a result of patient movement and growth. Um, again, the literature is, is, uh, is very complete in terms of uh, tracking the performance of the ventriculoperitoneal shunt that I described. Again, it's a 60-year-old procedure, so there's a lot of data out, out there about the rate of failure. But most neurosurgeons will agree that the failures are anywhere from 40 to 50 percent within the first couple of years. So our approach is to convert this open surgical procedure to a minimally invasive endovascular approach. And this is our device. Um, on the right-hand side is the device. It's three centimeters in length. Uh, it's designed to mimic the function of the arachnoid granulation. We place this in a, a dural venous sinus at the base of the brain uh, with the, the anchor portion in the subarachnoid space and the catheter that allows the drainage of cerebrospinal fluid uh, that, that resides in a venous outflow at the base of the brain. So again, its, it's overall design is to mimic the natural uh, function of the arachnoid granulation. We place this in a dural venous sinus at the base of the brain that's well known to interventional neurosurgeons and interventional practitioners. Uh, it's called the inferior petrosal sinus. We have one on either side. Um, you can see the device uh, depicted in the center of this slide as it's placed at the junction of the jugular vein and the IPS. And on the, on the left-hand side of the slide is a cross-section of the inferior petrosal sinus, again, encased in bone with a taut dural, uh, a layer of dura at one aspect, which is opposite a large cistern of cerebrospinal fluid. So we navigate to that location, we deploy our device across the dura, and we allow cerebrospinal fluid to pass under pressure from the subarachnoid space <clears throat> into the venous uh, compartment. Um, we believe that we can address many of the failure modes of the VP shunt by reducing the incidence of infection, obstruction, over and under drainage, and mechanical failures. And as a result, um, do what, what has been done in many other fields uh, in converting open surgical procedures to minimally invasive procedures like the one that, that we're about to introduce. <clears throat> Excuse me. From a clinical standpoint, uh, we've conducted a first in human study. We've got great, uh, very powerful and compelling safety and efficacy data from that study. We use that to support an IDE for a pilot study in the United States. We actually have three protocols open currently uh, enrolling patients, and our expectation is to file an IDE with the FDA in the first half of next year for a pivotal trial uh, in the United States. We expect that that will be a single arm study compared to historical control. As I said, the VP shunt, the standard of care, is 60 years old. There's a lot of data supporting the performance of that technology. So we believe FDA will be open to a single arm study. Uh, in terms of uh, our first in human study, we had to demonstrate that our device did what we said it would do, and that is lower elevated intracranial pressure. So we selected patients with acquired communicating hydrocephalus. So for, starting on the left, these are patients who have a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. That aneurysm is treated typically uh, by an endovascular practitioner by, with coiling. That patient then has a drain in place in their ventricle that drains blood and cerebrospinal fluid uh, for a period of time. Within that drain is an intracranial pressure monitor. And after about a week, the doctor clamps that drain. If the pressure remains normal, the drain is pulled. If the pressure remains elevated, they'll unclamp the drain, try again in a couple of days. So in these patients that have developed communicating hydrocephalus as a result of the aneurysm, we were able to monitor ICP, intracranial pressure, following the placement of our device. <clears throat> and this is our first patient treated. This is, this is really kind of a historical patient in that um, no patient has ever been treated before without open surgery for hydrocephalus. So this is an 84-year-old woman. She had a ruptured MCA treated with coiling. She, uh, she developed communicating hydrocephalus. And as you can see on the chart on the left-hand side, at the time that her ventricular drain was clamped, her intracranial pressure was nearly twice what's assumed to be the normal level, which is 20 uh, centimeters of water. And uh, at the time that our device is placed, you can see a rapid decline in ICP and then a maintenance of that 
that normal intracranial pressure over the next 36 hours, which was the primary endpoint for this study. We have five additional patients in that first in human study <clears throat> that have the same pattern. Uh, we also have a, a pilot study in Argentina in patients with normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, and we have really very strong clinical results that show improvement in the three, the triad of symptoms that I mentioned, um, impaired gait, impaired cognitive function, and urinary incontinence. Um, I'm a little bit over time here. Let me just go to uh, the clinical strategy that we have, again, is to complete these pilot studies, file an IDE with the FDA in the first half of 2023, uh, conduct our, our pivotal trial, uh, and gain FDA approval in 2024. Um, and we're now uh, in the process of a Series B financing with a, a goal of, of raising $50 million. This is the, the use of proceeds. We have a, a lead term sheet that we're negotiating. Um, and so I think we're well on our way to actually raising this, this round and funding the further clinical development of our, of our technology. Thanks very much.